All right. Welcome everyone to the AMA for August 2018. Let's jump right in. Okay, let me refresh this. Dylan, always at the top. If Chansity's Kin Explorer is any indication, Kin Beta on Kick is not doing as well as Kinet. It seems that a majority of users that create a wallet don't even complete the tutorial. Maybe a few percent are engaged daily and, a number, and the number is dropping. Many in the community feel that chat themes are not great. Fair enough. And as the only spend offer in the marketplace, nobody is incentivized to earn. True. What have you learned over the last five weeks and how will you use those learnings to improve the kin experience inside of Kick going forward? Okay. Good question, Dylan. Starting us strong. I think Kinet and Kick are different. Um, so I think what we wanted to do with Kinet is to provide a very simple experience for people to have their first taste of Kin. You know, very easily you can come in, you can earn your first Kin, you can see things that you can spend it on, and you can actually spend it. And you can experience the, that feeling of earning and spending a cryptocurrency. And then you could tell your friends. So I think the experience in Kinet is meant to give people that first taste of the Kin experience, and then to get them to share, to bring them and their family and their friends into the ecosystem. The cost of that, though, of course, is that we have to subsidize the gift cards. You know, what you do to earn Kin on one side does not cover all of the costs for what you get when you spend on the other side. In Kick, it's different. Uh, in Kick, we already have millions of users, so we don't need to subsidize. So the real question with Kick, well, the first question was, could we put a cryptocurrency into Kick in the same way that we put Kick points into Kick from a technical technical point of view? And the answer is yes. And just like with Kick points, we started with something very simple with Kin, which was chat themes. You know, do I think chat themes light the world on fire? No. But were they a very simple way for us to get that first earn and spend experience into Kick? The answer is yes. And so now that we have done that, the question that Kick is asking itself is, how can we integrate Kin into the core experience of Kick in a way that actually gets millions of people earning and spending Kin in a way that makes their Kick experience better? In a way where if we were to say to them, hey, listen, all those things that you spend Kin on today, would you would you like it if we made them free? And today with chat themes, obviously the answer would be yes. You know, hey, I have to pay, but if I could get for free, I would prefer that. But we actually think there's things inside Kick where the answer would be no. Where as a user, you'd say, no, 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 you don't understand. If you take Kin out of this, you're going to ruin my Kick experience. I need Kin to be a part of it because of how it impacts the experience. And so that's what we're now focused on with Kick. So I would say with Kick. You know, what have we learned in the last five weeks? We have learned that we can incorporate a cryptocurrency no different than how we integrated kick points. But from there, the next step is to integrate it in a way that becomes core to the kick experience that actually makes the kick experience better. Uh, so that's the next focus for what we do with kick. Adam, I like your writing, Adam. Good medium posts. Ted, the current state of the Kin SDKs and their documentation leaves a lot to be desired. True. There's no support for a web SDK. The mobile SDKs are missing crucial features, including the ability to back up keys. The documentation still references the old seller chain. There's no mention of how developers earn from these integrations. There's ambiguity about the KRE. The developer support platform doesn't yet exist. All true. From the community perspective, this makes the contest seem rushed. Why was now the right time to launch this developer contest rather than three to six months from now when a more robust ecosystem exists? What is the team capitalizing on by launching now that outweighs the risk of some developers not applying due to the shortcomings of the ecosystem? The short answer to this is what do we gain now is by getting it into market sooner, we start learning sooner. 
That's why we launched now because we want to start learning as soon and as fast as we can so we can get as far ahead in this race as possible. And when it comes to launching platforms, this is something we have a lot of experience with at Kick. We were the first chat app to launch a platform back in 2011, first chat app to launch a web platform in 2012, first chat app in the Western world to launch a bots platform in 2014. Uh, so we have a lot of experience launching platforms. And the question we always ask ourselves when deciding when to launch is, if we were to launch this now, is it possible that a developer could build something interesting? Not is it probable, but is it possible? Because if it is possible, we should put it out now. Because if it is possible to build something interesting, then we can attract developers to come build interesting. And then by having them try to build interesting things, we can learn more now, today. And so that's when we decided, we said, OK, we have fork Stellar so that we actually have a scalable blockchain that can support these transactions. We have a SDK that makes it easy to plug into that. We have learnings from Kick. And so while there is still much to be desired, many more holes that we need to fill for sure, all those things, it is certainly possible that developers can now build something interesting. And if that is true, we should launch today, even though we know we have all these holes, because we will start learning sooner. And the sooner we learn, the faster we can move, the more we can get ahead. And so that's why we launch it now, knowing full well it's imperfect, so that we can start learning. Good question, though. OK. Chase Eby. I never know how you say your name whenever you Chase Eby. I don't respond to replies, so you gotta got to get your own question out. OK. Dylan. Dylan, we did say in the last AMA that going forward, we would only do one question per person. As much as I love you, I'm not going to answer this question. OK. Even though Mr. Crypto says, wow, great question. One can always rely on Dylan to get it right to it, for sure. Oh, Dylan, another one. <laughs> Maybe I will do another one for you. Let me scroll down here. OK, I'm going to keep going. Dean Machine. I have all the faith in you guys doubling down on your own blockchain, but can you shed some light on why Orbs was so bluntly abandoned. Was there a revelation with Stellar's tech that provided you with ample scalability? Thanks and keep up the good work, you bunch of animal champion warriors. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Um, Orbs. This one created some confusion. Um, it created some confusion because like from our point of view, we actually made the decision not to use orbs months ago, three over three months ago now. But to the community, so so from our point of view, we spent a lot of time working up to what we felt was like a very simple blog of, hey, just FYI, there's some confusion around this, here's some clarity. But I think from the community's perspective, it might have felt abrupt because there, there was no post and then there is a post and that happened at one point in time. And so we actually, decided, uh, I was asked and, and agreed to get on a call with our ambassadors just to give someone more of the context. And what I did there is I just told the story of, of sort of how we got, what led up to that blog post. Because uh, there's a lot of speculation about it. And so maybe what would work well is for me to just share that same story. Um, so. When we decided to go all in on crypto, to go all in on our token sale, we knew we had a lot of experience with sort of the go-to-market side of launching a currency inside an app and building an economy around it. We had done that with Kick Points inside of our very popular app called Kick. And we also have felt like we had a lot of experience in crypto. We had been paying attention for a very long time, going to conferences, going back to 2012. Um, like we had spent a lot of time in crypto, but when it came specifically to doing a token sale, we were new to that. And so when we decided to go all in, we sort of looked around, asked for recommendations on who could sort of be advisors to that. And the two advisors that sort of got recommended the most that came back that we really liked were Coin Fund out of New York and Coin Tree out of Tel Aviv, Israel. 
And so we worked with each of them, CoinFund more on sort of the uh, marketing side, the white paper, those pieces, uh, and Cointree on the technical side. And the team at Cointree was great. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a guy named Tal there, Oded, Leonid, Nama, and then also two brothers, Uriel and Daniel. And through that token sale, I think both teams really liked working with each other. We really respected them and their sort of experience in the space. And so we said, hey, you know, this is going really well. You guys see what we see with Kin. Why don't you guys come onto our team? Why don't we acquire you? And everybody's really excited about that. We sort of draw up the paperwork and let's do an acquisition. Uh, but then at the last minute, uh, Daniel, who's the leader of the project, came and said, listen, I'm super excited about Kin but you guys aren't focused on the technology side. I think there's an opportunity on the technology side. I really want to pursue it, so I can't be part of this acquisition, but maybe we could build it for you. And I sort of hummed and hawed. I was like, listen, I think the application layer is going to commoditize the technology layer. You know, I think because all this sort of um, uh, leverage is in the application layer, I think these like technology layers are going to be commodities. And he said, you know what, you're probably right. We went through a big discussion on it, but I want to try anyways, and there's a big opportunity here. So I said, okay, that's fine. So what do you want to do? He said, and what we agreed one is, okay, let's have Tall, Leonid, Nama, and Oded. They'll become Kick employees. They'll work on Kin, but they can also work on Orbs 50% of their time. So they can work on both projects at the same time, even though they're Kick employees. And we said, okay, that's great. Uh, let's do that. Um, so Daniel and Uriel went off and did their thing, and then Tal, Linid, Oded, and Nama uh, worked on both. And Tal was really our technical lead on the blockchain side, and he is a super smart guy. I have a ton of respect for Tal. And so we were sort of working through, okay, Ethereum, that's not gonna scale, what are all the options? Um, hey, of all the options, let's move to Stellar. It's built not for smart contracts, just for high scalability. Actually, we need sort of the security of Ethereum combined with the scalability of Stellar. Let's do that. And so we did that, um, but we wanted to test it. And so what we did is we launched sort of a, a test of Kin on the Stellar testnet. But the Stellar testnet kept going down. Like, it wasn't reliable. And so we said, okay, it's not reliable. Like, you know, there's nobody really maintaining the Stellar testnet. Let's spin up our own testnet. And so we did that and we started testing on there and it was working really well. We took all the code, we copy and pasted it and we started our own sort of fork of Stellar, which we were running, which we thought was our test net. But the more we worked on this, the more I sort of realized like, wait a second, what's the difference between a test net and a main net? You know, the only difference is the people running the nodes. Otherwise it's the same. What if we just, stuck with our testnet and just called it a mainnet. What if we turned our testnet into the mainnet? What if we forked Stellar? And the first time I brought this up with Tall was actually in New York at the Ambassador event. And I said, hey, Tall, like, I know you're working on Kin and Orbs, and Orbs, you know, a lot of good stuff going on there, but I think we should just fork Stellar and keep going the path we're going. What do you think? And at that point, he didn't have like a good answer for me. You know, he's like, oh, um, hmm, that's interesting. Let me think about that. I said, you know, totally, let's focus on the ambassador event. You think about that. Um, but I kept asking him, and, and there was sort of no good answer. You know, he's sort of trying to find an answer. and um, But it, it wasn't um, it wasn't a clear articulation. And until the point he said, you know what? I think it makes sense. I think it makes sense for Kim to port Stellar and for you to go that path, and then I'll go for focus on it. I was like, totally, that's great. So we announced that to the team. It went over really well. Uh, we stayed friends. You know, we kept sort of advising each other. And that was back in um, May, I believe, back in May. And so we kept working. You know, we were all in on our own blockchain. We're controlling our own destiny. It's working. All our test results are great. This is amazing. Uh, but we kept sort of hearing these comments from the community that, People were saying that Kick was still working with Orbs. Kick was still working with Orbs. Kin was still working with Orbs. We're like, no, like we already said, like we're we're working on our own blockchain, and you know we're not we're not working with Orbs anymore. We're focused on our own blockchain. But it kept sort of happening and was being sort of perpetuated. And so we eventually said, hey, Orbs guys, we want to put out this really simple blog post, just saying we're focusing on our own blockchain and wish you guys all the best. 
Uh, you guys are doing something different anyway, so all is good. Um, and they had a very negative reaction to that blog post. Um, and and it, honestly, it, it wasn't clear why. You know, if, if I took Kin and Orbs and replaced it with, you know, EOS and Tezos and put that post out, I don't think anybody would care. Um, but there was a negative reaction. We sort of tried to work with them for a week. And then eventually we said, you know, we just have to post. We just have to post this. It's just the truth. And so we put it out there. Um, and so that's really all there is to it. We put the post out there. Um, you know, we wish Orbs all the best. I think Tall is a super smart guy. And, you know, we drive forward. So you know, hopefully that sort of closes the chapter on this one, on this one and gives you all the clarity that you guys are looking for. But uh, we're super excited to be focused on our own blockchain. We think that was you know, a killer decision that we're so happy we made. And, you know, everything is coming together. So we're very excited about it. Thank you, Dean Machine. I don't know if I've seen you before, Dean Machine. Maybe. Maybe. Lost in Kin Crypto. Ooh, what keeps you up at night in bold? Ted, as a community, we all believe in Kin's potential and how it can become the disruptor it is designed to be. Much has been in the news or online media about data privacy, how companies are obtaining data, and consumers as mules, etc. I haven't heard mules, but I will take your word for it. Kin has, for over a year, been working to change that dynamic, as you say, so that everyone wins benefits from the devs, advertisers, and users. We are starting to see the fruits of Kin's labor with much more to come over the next six months or so. My question is, what keeps you up at night? Meaning, what could prevent Kin from reaching its goal? Is it Facebook jumping fast and furious into crypto with their size money? SEC, lack of user adoption, lack of interest from developers and advertisers, Bigfoot, or the Loch Ness? <laughs> what keeps me up at night? I actually was asked this question recently. Um, and the answer I gave is sort of like tied back to Kick and the history of Kick. What is the history of Kick? The history of Kick is a 10-year history at this point, uh, full of amazing wins, but also painful setbacks. And when I look back at the history of Kick, there's sort of two setbacks that are painfully seared into my mind. <laughs> The first setback was uh, when BlackBerry kicked us off their platform and tried to destroy us. Um, we went viral on BlackBerry in October 2010, zero to a million users in 15 days, million to two million users in seven days. And really because we were the first cross-platform chat app that also had a great BlackBerry app. And why? Because we were in Waterloo and we had BlackBerry and we liked BlackBerry. And nobody else in the rest of the world cared about BlackBerry. Um, and yet, BlackBerry was still a third of the market. And so when a, a great cross-platform chat app that had great app for iPhone, Android, and BlackBerry, it exploded. Just exploded. Fastest growing thing in known human history. But what happened next is that we threatened BlackBerry. They said, wait a second. We need BlackBerry Messenger to sell our phones. We can't have some competitor that's better than BlackBerry Messenger. How will we sell our phones? Then you can get an iPhone, Android, BlackBerry. doesn't matter. Crush them. And so what did they do? Uh, they sued us for patent infringement. They shut down access to push notifications. They shut down access to their tools. And they removed us from the App Store. And we lost 99% of our users over the next three weeks. So it was, we went from the fastest growing thing in human history, people flying in from all over the world to meet us, to being completely forgotten. That was painful. That was very painful. And so I think that is the first lesson. The first thing that keeps me up at night is who could unfairly try to kill us? Because the thing that happened with BlackBerry is BlackBerry then realized, which we told them, that there was a million messengers behind us and that they weren't going to be able to shut down them all. And at the time, there was this little crappy app called WhatsApp that was just sort of text and lines, and that was it. It was like a terrible app. And that's the one they let through. And that's the one that three years later sold for $19 billion. Um, and BlackBerry at that point was irrelevant. 
So I think the first thing that keeps me in my eye is who are the people who could unfairly try to kill us and how could we get ahead of that? And really what that boils down to is who do we threaten? Who does cryptocurrency threaten? Who do we threaten as a project? And how could we work with them today to show them that in the long run that this will be good for them and that in the long run it's an unstoppable force anyways? And how do we get on their team today? And we tried to do that with BlackBerry. You know, we tried to show them there would be a bunch of other messengers behind us. We tried to show them that this feature was going to be inevitable, but we didn't lay enough groundwork up front, not nearly enough groundwork up front, to sort of assure us that that is the conclusion they would come to when Kick really took off. So that's the first thing that keeps me up at night. The second thing that keeps me up at night is Facebook. You know, if I go back to the Kick story, we get kicked off BlackBerry, we lose all of our users, 99% of our users over three weeks, we are completely forgotten, you know, caught lightning in a bottle and then disappeared. Uh, most, one of the most painful experiences of my life. But we fucking came back. Um, we came back, we doubled down, we said, okay, what is the unique segment we can focus on? Let's focus on usernames instead of phone numbers. Let's build something different. Let's build it without BlackBerry. Let's figure out how to become a platform. Let's prove to the world that we were worthy of that first hit. And we did that, uh, culminating in 2014, we received a investment from Tencent that valued Kick at a billion dollars. It was the first billion dollar consumer company, consumer from beginning, consumer tech company in all of Canada. And we did it coming back from a complete reset. And it's not like Tencent is some um, uh, investor who doesn't really know what they're talking about. Um, Tencent is one of the most sophisticated consumer uh, services tech companies in the world. Uh, they are the Facebook of China. They have a billion daily active users. And so it wasn't like, hey, we convinced some you know, sovereign wealth fund to give us some money. It was like, here was one of the most sophisticated consumer tech companies in the world saying, no, these guys get it. They, despite their struggles, are worth a billion dollars and we will put $50 million behind them. So we came back, we came back from the dead. But what happened? Facebook, once again, just copied and crushed us. Just like they do to everybody else, they just said, oh, that's interesting now, we will now take that for ourselves. Oh, that's interesting now, we'll take that for ourselves. And it's not because they're bad people. It's not because they're bad people. It's because they are a public company that has to keep growing. They have to keep growing and growing and growing, so they have to find more and more sources of revenue. And it's at a point where they can never come up with all these ideas of their own, so they just copy them. But I think the painful thing about Facebook is they don't only copy them, but they use everything at their disposal to also crush them. So the second thing that keeps me up at night is when Facebook comes for us to copy and crush us, how will we set things up so that this time it won't be so easy? And to me, this is, in my 10 years working on gig and working in consumer technology, is the most exciting thing about cryptocurrencies because for the first time ever, it gives a way to developers to work together. You know, before when Facebook's uh, copying and crushing Snapchat stories, we, we sit there and I'm like, Evan Spiegel, you know, this is so unfair. Why are they doing that to you? It's not fair. It's not right. But good luck. You know, good luck. I can't help you. I can only sympathize you because they're doing the same thing to us. But I cannot help you. And I think the exciting thing for cryptocurrencies is for the first time ever, there's a way for developers to work together. Not just a philosophical way to work together, but an economical way to work together. Where we could say to someone like Evan, listen, if we adopt this cryptocurrency business model, then I will make more money the more that you win. And the more that you win, the more you win, I make more money, and the more that I win, you make more money. So now we're just trying to figure out how to help each other win because we are economically aligned. And I think what that will do for the first time ever is allow all of these developers to come together and compete as one. And at a time in history, and this gets me so excited, when Facebook is having its first 
real doubts in the public, where the public for the first time ever is saying, wait a second, this isn't right. Wait a second, I am being inauthentic on Facebook. I am being addicted on Facebook. You are taking all my data and value on Facebook for yourselves and you're not sharing it with me. Where consumers are waking up to the unfairness of the Facebook model. And so when you put those two things together, on one side, a way for developers to work together to compete with these monopolies, and on the other side, a global sense among consumers that this is no longer okay, when you put those two things together, um, and I think for the first time ever, we just might be able to take down a monopoly. And what keeps me up at night is I want to make sure we put everything in place to set it up so that that can happen. And I don't want to miss anything, and I don't want our team to miss anything. Are we missing anything to prepare for that inevitable day and that inevitable competition where Facebook, once again, uh, tries to take everything for themselves? OK. Has there been an update on iOS beta for Kinet, and how many and how have things been going with Apple? Are we likely to see Kinet and Kick scaled and released outside of the United States soon? Thanks. P.S. We are all scared of the latest news about you know who he who shall not be named. Move like the wind, brother. Can't imagine who that is. <laughs> I'm going to answer the second question here, and it probably means I won't have time to answer it. So let me answer the first one really quickly. We continue to have great conversations with people at Apple. Crypto is something that's new. It's something that is different and on its outset appears to compete with in-app purchase. And in a way, it does. It does. But at the same time, crypto is not going back in the box. And I think the right analogy here is like the music labels, looking at digital music, back in you know, the early 2000s or whenever that was. You know, the labels are like, no, 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 we don't want any of this because it competes with CDs. And we really like CDs. It's simple. We know it. But at some point, the labels realized that digital music was not going back in the box. And at that point, their only question is, who could we work with first? And who did they work with first? They worked with Apple. And that led to the iTunes, which led to the iPod, which led to the iPhone, which led to the world's first trillion dollar company. Um, so with Apple, I think it's a similar thing. It does it does compete with that purchase, but it is not going back in the box. So our, our goal is to be that partner for them, to help them work through it, trusted that's looking for the win-win for them, not the win-lose like so many of their competitors will be. And so I would say the talks with Apple are going very well. Now, the latest news about you know who, who you shut up today. Facebook is coming. Uh, it's clear. Um, you know, David Marcus stepped off the Coinbase board for a reason. Why? You only step off the board if you have a conflict. And you only have a conflict with Coinbase if you're doing something major in crypto. So they are certainly doing something major in crypto. You know, there was a story there about them forking Stellar uh, for period, but, you know, they shot that down. I'm not sure where that rumor would have come from. Usually where there's smoke, there's fire. I thought that was funny that they also are looking at Stellar. But I don't think we should be scared of Facebook. I don't think we should be scared of Facebook. Facebook entering this race in a directly competitive way is inevitable. Inevitable. Just count on it. <laughs> For 10 years, I've been hoping that this time they won't do it, but they always do. They always do. They're smart. They always do. And when they see an opportunity, unlike all the other big tech monopolies, they fucking go for it. They're very smart. So they're inevitably going to come into this race. And it will come down to a race between two ecosystems, between Kin and between Basecoin, whatever they call it. And I think the exciting thing to me is, you know, it is the evil empire versus the rebel alliance. Not, maybe not evil empire, not evil. You know, they're just playing out the incentives that you have when you're a public company. But they are the empire. They own the world. They have billions of consumers 
when I opened my iPhone yesterday, they're the top three apps in social networking. But they are the empire, and we are the rebel alliance. And this time around, because there's a way to win together by working together, where developers can evaluate, hey, whether the evil empire wins or the rebel alliance wins, to me, I can make the same amount of money. I can make the same amount of money, right? Because there's going to be one cryptocurrency at the end of the day, probably get the same portion over here that I get over here. Maybe I'll get even a little bit more over here. So if the money is the same at the end of the day, who? the question is, who do I want to win? Who do I want to win? And this time around, with everything that's going on, with scandals and privacy and data and all these negative things, depression, isolation, that have been brought about by social media, this time around, given that you can make just as much money regardless of whoever wins, this time around, I'm very excited that we are the underdog, that we are the rebel alliance, because I think this is who the world will want to win. Thank you very much for tuning in to this month's AMA, and we will see you next month.